morning, everyone, and welcome to Sunday Morning Fellowship. My name is Brenda Gray, and this morning we're going to be discussing who do you say that I am, an intimate relationship with the Father. But before we dive in, we're going to go ahead and open up with prayer. Father, I thank you that you have brought us here today um, and that you'll give us divine revelation of what it is that you are speaking to us. May our hearts be receptive to what it is that you will be sharing with us. And whatever we don't understand, we will take it to you and ask for revelation, knowledge, and then understanding will come. I thank you that you are always with us and that you always hear. Amen. Love and eternity are immeasurable. There is no pathway to love. One must enter this eternal realm through the door. Now, many times, and you can hold it right there for a moment, Jim, people will look at the door and they will say, oh, how beautiful this door is, how gorgeous this door is, you know, and, and talk about the door. But until you go through that door, you will not realize or experience what is on the other side. In John 10, 9, and this is coming from the Amplified, Jesus is saying, I am the door. Anyone who enters through me will be saved and will live forever and will go in and out freely and find pasture or spiritual security. Who do you say that I am? When Father presented this question to me, I immediately, my mind immediately went to Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. And um, I'll go ahead and read it as such. It says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Then Simon Peter, he answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And as I finished, I thought, wow, okay, I got that one. And then I heard Father say to me, yes. This was the question my son Jesus asked Peter concerning himself. And then he turned it back again and he said, but my question to you was, who do you personally say that I am? And I said, you are father. And I thought what that was going to be the end of the conversation. But I should have known better being that I didn't answer the original question <laughs> that was asked. I tried to push that question aside. You know, I would hear the question in the back ground of my thoughts as I went about my day. And um, I kept trying to prepare a different message for today, but I could not ignore the nudging from the Holy Spirit taking me in another direction. And the fact that I was asked the question was an indication, or it should have been an indication to me, that Father wanted to reveal another facet of himself to me as Father. So with that, let's go. God and human reasoning. When most people hear the word God, what comes to mind is creator, or they think of love, grace, mercy, and that's just to name a few. But just for a moment, I want you to forget about the word God, like G-O-D, you know, because we know that's not his name. And what you think about who is this source, and sustainer of all things. First off, this being is infinite. He's self-existing without origin. Immaterial, he's spiritual, omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent, he's everywhere. Omniscient, all-knowing, immutable, he's unchangeable, and this one, I started to take off, self-sufficient. He has no needs. 
And he said, no, leave that. He said, because I do not have any needs. And I said, well, Father, what about the reciprocation of love? He said, that was met in eternity when the word became a son. He said, that was done in eternity. So I have no needs, not like what you think of as far as to sustain myself. Now, according to the ancient Greek philosopher, Aristotle, he says, God is divine intellect or nous, the unmoved mover that stands as final cause, responsible for the intelligible motion of the cosmos. Aristotle, he conceived God as outside of the world, as the final cause of all motion in nature. Now, because of the finite cap capabilities of man's comprehension, like Aristotle, many people tend to view God as someone from the outside looking in or as someone who is keeping everything in place. God is no more than just the source or sustainer of life and the cosmos. There is no intimacy or personal knowing of this divine supreme being referred to as God. I was taking a look in Isaiah chapter 40. I did not think I would be taken there for this message. And after I read the entire chapter of Isaiah, I was led by the spirit to go outside. And as I'm looking up at the vastness of the sky and the stars and hearing and feeling the effects of the wind, a thought comes to mind. He says, do you see the wind? I say, no, I don't see the wind. Do you know where it's coming from? My answer is no. I said, but I can feel the wind on my face and I can hear the sound of it. I can also see the leaves moving because of its motion. And I think to myself, I'm only experiencing a very small, tiny, minuscule fraction of creation. And as wonderful as this experience was, it could not express to me the depth of his presence or his essence, his nature. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 25 and 26 says, to whom then will you liken me or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number? He calls them all by name by greatness of his might and strength of his power, not one is missing. And go ahead and scroll up a little bit to Romans 120. He says, for the invisible things of him from creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead so that they are without excuse. And as I read through this, I thought, wow, though we can look at what is visible around us in nature, what God has made, and we can arrive at some obvious conclusion about what is not visible, there is still no intimacy, no personal relationship to this knowledge. There are many who do this. They look out and they see this, the vastness of the universe, and they think, this is God. You know, a lot of times people will have the notion to try and say, the universe is what keeps things in alignment. And if you line up with the universe, things will be the way that they're supposed to be and that you can look to that as your guide. But they don't realize the universe is within this being, this supreme being. So I'm going to go through now um, a little intimate story. Uh, not, a, not a story, it's an actual testimony 
that um, I had a conversation with a young woman that uh, works with my sister, Deborah. Her name is Tawanda Henry. And I do believe she's on this morning. And if I misquote anything later, she'll be able to correct me <laughs> on it. She says, and this is her first conscious memory with God at the age of four. And she's written about it in one of her books titled, Don't Let the Enemy Silence Your Voice. She says, I was about four years old. And while sitting on my porch, gazing into the sky, I heard a voice say, who are you? I respond, who are you? The voice responds, I am God. Then she says, I say, then why can't I see you? And then he says, but I can see you. She then goes on to say, well, if I go in my house, you won't see me. Now you have to remember, this is a four-year-old child who is not even looking, not even seeking or searching to even have a conversation with quote unquote God. And the voice responds to her again, yes, I will see you. She says then, well, <laughs> if I go in the house and I pile clothes on top of me, you won't see me. And the voice responds again, yes, I will still see you. And that was the end of her conversation. And I thought, wow, Father, how wonderful, how wonderful and how incomprehensible you are to us. We try to put you in this box or in our own human logic where it makes sense to us as to how you will speak to us and what you will say and what will be the outcome of the conversation. There was no grand um revelation at the end of the conversation. He didn't tell her to go out and look for, you know, 12 stones and, and go out and slay a giant or something and then start a church, you know, called the uh, Tawanda uh, McHenry or Henry uh, Evangelist something. I mean, it was just that simple conversation. And, you know, as I thought about that conversation over and over, I thought, wow, Father, we have this image in our mind of what we think you are or who you are, what you look like. Some see, you know, arms outstretched, hands outreached. And, you know, when things are going bad, we can go up and sit in this father's lap and he'll hug us and hold us tight and tell us everything will be all right. Man, just like that, um, the illustration J David shared with the broken glass, the broken, when he broke the glass and he said that identity, that image is gone now. That broke my image of that hands reaching out in the lap and all of that. I said, that's a human. That's me and my human thinking. Hands in a lap and all of that. So he shattered that. And so I was like, Father, where do I go now? I don't even have an image in my mind of who, what, how. And so he said, well, let's carry on, my son. I will show you. And so we begin with the father revealed. He took me to John 1, 1 verses 1, 14 and 18. And he says this, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him the father. John is the only writer who begins with the eternal existence of Jesus Christ rather than the time he appears on earth. Logos, the word given to describe his existence at the beginning, beginning is the intelligence. He originated everything that is. He was the word, which is the expression that explains that intelligence and is undiscoverable except through the revelation of not, the revelation knowledge of fathers. 
John is declaring that no created being has ever seen God in his essence as spirit, except the son. I'm going to see if I can pray. This unique son or unique God, and this is how some manuscripts have it as the unique son or unique God who has always been in the bosom of father, manifested the Godhead and made him father understood. The son revealed the father's nature. I want to stop right here. The other day I was listening to a gentleman's um, experience. He had a near-death experience. And I've listened to a few of them and I thought, oh, okay. But this one, this young man, he said something really interesting. He said in his near-death experience, he seen an angel and the angel bowed before him. And he said, why are you doing that? Why are you bowing? He said, because I see the light of the creator in you. And I thought that was interesting, you know, that we are the reflection of the father's nature. That light spiritually is shown through us, in us, and we are it, that light. It says, in the beginning, this is an allusion to Genesis 1.1. And this is what I'm saying What John says, in the beginning was the word. With this, this is with the intention of linking Jesus, the word, with the God of creation. The word is Jesus, the Christ, the eternal, ultimate expression of God. In the Old Testament, God spoke the world into existence. In the gospel, God spoke his word through the living word, his son. And. The phrase, the word was God, attributes deity to the word without defining all of the Godhead as the word. To know the essence or nature of a trying, triune deity, God, can only come from the revelation knowledge of the source itself. The idea that the word exchanged his identity to become the son then put on a body of flesh called Jesus and came into the bloodstream of humankind. That gripped my soul. I thought, whoa, oh, that is powerful. You cannot look out into the universe or into nature and derive something as magnificent as that. Nature in the universe did not come into humanity and to flesh and reveal the nature and essence of the source of all life, Father. In John 14, 7 through 11, he says, if you had known me, you would know my father as well. The use of the word my reveals the intimacy in the father-son relationship. He says, from now on, you do not know him. You do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Jesus, Lord, show us the father and that will be enough for us. And then Jesus says to him, Philip, I have been with you all this time and still you do not know me. Anyone who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you say? Show us the Father. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on account of the works themselves. Now, when Philip asks to be shown the father, and I'm paraphrasing Jesus' words, Jesus responds, Philip, you're looking at him live and in the flesh in living color. <laughs> but like many of us, Philip could not see what was right before his very eyes. You see, as an Old Testament believer, 
Philip, no doubt, knew that Moses had went up to the mount and saw the God of Israel, and that many others had been granted sensible uh, manifestations of his divine presence. And like many of us today, Philip longed for some similar sign to confirm his faith. As a man, he was conscious of the deep need which all of us have, whether we are conscious of it or not. And that is for something more real and tangible than an invisible and unknowable God. Philip's petition is childlike in its simplicity. It's beautiful in its trust, noble and true in its estimate of what men need. He not only longs to see God, but he refers to him as father. Show us the father. He didn't say show us the creator. He didn't say show us the source. He said show us the father. He's desiring this same intimacy with father that Jesus had. And he believes that Christ can show, show him God, show him the Father. He is sure that the sight of God the Father will satisfy his heart. Philip wanted a palpable manifestation, one that could be felt with the senses, one that could be touched. And I can relate to Philip. Listen, there have been times when I have said, Father, I know you're here but I need to see you. Can you just give me a sign? I need to know that you're here with me. I, I just need the assurance of your presence. Can you just send someone to give me a confirming word? Uh, Father, I just need you to show up. I needed to see him, to sense him in some, some kind of tangible way with my senses so that I could be assured. But that was really all in the flesh. But at the time, I didn't know it. <laughs> that that's what the longing was coming from. Many religions and people have idols because they want a God that can be touched, felt, and perceived with the natural human senses. And that's what I was just talking about. But no matter how beautiful or elaborate the idol is, it cannot satisfy nor meet the deep spiritual longing of the soul to know his creator, not just his creator, but know him as father. In Colossians 1, 15 through 17, we have the expression of the father. The son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, the son, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. There is in Christ not merely the creative cause, but also the cause which brings about organic stability and continuance and unity, preserving and, and governing for the whole of existing things. The Greek word here means an exact revelation and representation. Image always assumes a prototype, that is the original form from which it was drawn, not merely a thing it resembles. And an example would be the reflection of the sun in the water. Paul was telling the Colossians that Jesus has a prototype, God the Father, who is invisible or unseen. In Hebrews 1, 3 through 5, he says this, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his the Father's nature, upholding all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he became as far superior to the angels as the name he has inherited, which is son. 
is excellent beyond theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. The son is the visible expression of his father's essence or nature. We too, the spiritual sons, are the visible expression of our father's nature. I want to stop right there for a moment. Um, I'm just reminded of a, um, a time when my father was transitioning and I spoke to him. We were having a conversation and, you know, he was saying, I would like to stay here a little longer and be able to enjoy you and my grandchildren. And, you know, he said, but if it's time, if the father says it's time to go, then it's time to go. And I had said to him, well, you know, daddy, that's the only way that you're going to see Jesus or that's the only way you're going to see the father. And he said to me, no, when I look in your face, I see the son. I didn't know what that meant at the time, but now, now I understand and I know what that means. I am the express image of my father and his nature, not after the flesh, but spiritually. We may not fully realize it, and we may not consistently walk in the spiritual nature or expression of our father, but that does not diminish the fact that his nature is alive and working and living in us. Romans 8, 15 and 16 says this, the spirit you received did not make you slaves, that you should live in fear again, rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption, your birth to sonship. And we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And that is for each and every one of us. If you have been spiritually birthed, you are his son. Thank you and amen. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact me at brenda at inchristmessage.org. Thank you.